Remember in like the olden days when westerns was the big movie trend? Then a couple decades later, aliens and sci-fi movies were the big craze? And then around the same time, time travel started to dominate both movies and shows? <sighs> Even when it made zero sense whatsoever? Of course, most recently, the big trend seems to be taking comic book characters, big or small, and giving them their own movie. It's morbid time. The point that I'm trying to make is that every few decades, you get a popular trend in entertainment that seems to hang around for quite a while, and everyone tries to get in on the action and add their own spin to it. And by now, I guess you know where I'm going with this, urge and multiversal content. And everyone, and I mean everyone, has their hands in the cookie jar right now. Marvel and DC are the two biggest in the game right now. They've been absolutely killing it with their multiverse content, both live action and animated. Cartoon Network's gotten in on the action, and we're even receiving original films not based on pre-existing IPs that are following suit. But the fact of the matter is, as impressive as most of these projects are, there is one company that created the biggest multiverse of them all that not only contains most of our favorite characters that we grew up watching, but also kinda was purely by accident. <laughs> if you haven't guessed by now, I am of course talking about Disney Channel. We all grew up watching it, perhaps you're even still watching it, and most of us can name our favorite Disney Channel shows, <laughs> Zeke and Luther. And I'd love to talk about most of them individually, and I probably will, so how about you uh, click that subscribe button. But today is devoted to what I am calling the DCM, the Disney Channel Multiverse. Now before you run into comments and say, yeah, but so and so already made a video on this topic, yeah, yeah, I know. The crazy thing is, I've actually been researching this topic since like mid last year, and by the time I was actually in a position to start writing the script, I realized that there's been at least two big videos detailing this topic, and there's even more if you brought in the dates. However, although these videos are genuinely good videos and very informative, there are still some things that have been left unanswered that I haven't seen anyone else talk about. And because of my odd attachment to giving 110% to things that don't really matter, I think I have finally been able to make something big. Something that everyone needs to see. Because once you watch this video, you will know everything you need to know about where your favorite Disney Channel show fits in this large multiverse. Ladies and gentlemen, I have finally put together the complete map of the Disney Channel multiverse. multiverse. No plot holes, no skipping over shows, I answer every single possible world building question with facts and facts only. But wait, before I actually get into this whole thing, I should probably lay down some ground rules first. First and foremost, I will only be talking about shows that are made by Disney Channel. Acquired series, meaning generally things from Canada that Disney Channel simply aired but didn't actually produce, will not be included. So no, I will not be covering Life of Derek in this video and the world is a better place because of it. Second rule is that in order for me to pinpoint certain shows to certain worlds, there needs to be canonical, ca canonical, canon, canon proof that at least one property or person from another show or movie appears in another. But not only that, it has to be the exact same one from that show or movie. For instance, Tony Hawk makes appearances in Rocket Power, Drake and Josh, and Zack and Cody. Does that mean they're all connected? No. But if Tony Hawk made a reference to Zack and Cody about the time he was skateboarding with a bunch of ugly looking children and one of them was named Reggie, then yes, that would in fact make them connected. But if that event doesn't occur or anything similar to it, then it's safe to say that Tony Hawk just happens to exist in all of those separate worlds. Rule number three. This really isn't something that I'm going to really cover until later, but just to quickly get this out there, for this video, a crossover is deemed as canon unless there is something that happens in either show or movie involved that contradicts it from being so, or if the creator just comes out and says it's not canon. And you'll see what I'm talking about much deeper into the video. All right, now that we have all those rules out of the way, let's get started with unraveling this crazy multiverse. Okay, so, as some of you may or may not know, when Disney Channel first started, they weren't really doing crossovers. The idea of having crossovers and referencing other Disney shows was something that the creators back then didn't really think about. 
and it seemed to be a pretty common thing amongst kids networks because there was only really one actual children's sitcom crossover back then, that being the Kenan and Kel and Cousin Skeeter crossover on Nickelodeon, out of all things. But anyway, I decided to label this category here as pre-Earth Prime, which is what I call the Earth where most of the main shows take place in. This category will talk about all the Earths that came out before Earth Prime form and detailing everything connected to those individual worlds. So, without any further ado, let's get into it. Earth 1 on our list for the Disney Channel Multiverse is 1995's Flash Forward. Flash Forward is Disney Channel's first original series and follows the lives of two best friends and neighbors since birth, Tucker and Rebecca, and their respective adventures as they travel through the world of 8th grade. So Boy Meets World basically. Cool. I've only vaguely heard of this show, so I really don't have much to add in commentary on it, nor will I for most of these earlier shows, but the series ended in 1997, and it is the only Disney Channel series that exists on this earth. Oh yeah, and Ryan Gosling was also in this show. Next we have The Famous Jet Jackson, which premiered in 1998. The show follows the late Lee Thompson Young, who plays a teenage secret agent on a fictional TV show within a show called Silverstone. Although this was way before I started watching Disney, I am actually a bit familiar with the show via reruns. But the thing is, I think my child brain kinda ignored the whole actor on a spy TV show aspect, because I grew up thinking he was like, an actual spy in the series. It never occurred to me that there was this whole other half of the show that I seemingly just fizzled out of my head as a kid. But the world building extensions don't just stop there, because the show also received the Disney Channel original movie in the same continuity, thus pinning two projects to this earth. The next show we're going to talk about is so weird. No, seriously, that's what it's called. The show was basically like The X-Files, but for kids. A bunch of teens solving weird sci-fi mysteries and stuff. It was cool. Like I said earlier, these shows I'm only going to give brief explanations on just so I can explain why it's not connected to anything else. But if you are interested in the show, you should be pleased to know that it is the first show on this list that is actually available on Disney+, Plus. so give it a watch. What I found interesting though is that apparently in season 3, the lead actress left the show to pursue other opportunities other than Disney, which is hilarious because her most notable roles after this show included a one-off episode in As Told by Ginger and Z from All Grown Up. So basically they kinda had to like soft reboot the show into something a bit different but using the same characters. Sounds like another show I'll be talking about later in this video. Four. I'm not even going to try to talk about this show. It's about sports, I guess. It has a killer guest star list. Bushmouth from the Fat Albert movie and Nina from Cousin Skeeter are in it, so that's cool, I guess. Huh. Two Cousin Skeeter references in this video, and that's not even a Disney show. What are the odds? Next, we have Earth 5, which is in a heartbeat. They're like EMTs or something. Iceman from the X-Men movies is in it. Moving on. Even Stevens is the first Disney Channel show on this list that actually has something really interesting to bring to the table. It's the launching point of Shia LaBeouf's career, and it's probably the first Disney Channel series that people have a really strong connection with. Shia is arguably the network's first real star, having his own theatrical movie a few years later in Holes. This show was one of Disney's first hits, and I still see people talk about it to this day. Due to it never having any links with any other shows, the series is all alone on Earth 6, minus its original movie that served as its series finale. Earth 7 Lizzie McGuire was Disney's definitive early 2000s show, at least until Raven started to pick up in popularity. The series, following 13-year-old Lizzie, is about her struggles through her teenage years in middle school slash high school. What made the show very unique, however, was that her inner thoughts and emotions were conveyed through an animated persona that would speak to the audience on occasion. Remember this, because I'm going to bring it up again. Probably. I don't know, we'll see, but remember it. The thing about this era of Disney is that the reason why there weren't many crossovers is because there weren't many shows to begin with. Lizzie and Even were the only shows that were airing at the same time that were even remotely similar. And even then, a crossover just wouldn't have worked out because they were different enough to the point where it just wouldn't make any sense. The show was also like, big, really big. It was the first Disney Channel show to make it to the big screen, and it was treatment that no other series would get until Hannah Montana. Well, unless you want to count Teacher's Pet. They even tried to bring Lizzie back in 2019, although the revival fell apart due to creative differences. But you know what? Just in case it ever gets picked back up since the iCarly revival is doing fairly well on Paramount+, Plus, we're going to put that show, the original, and the movie on Earth 7. Just in case.
All right, so this is the part of the video that you guys will most likely be familiar with. There's been a bunch of videos detailing this jailed world that Disney Channel made, and even if you haven't seen those videos, chances are if you're watching this one, then you're aware of some of the more popular shows. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but really dig deep on some of the shows and Easter eggs that these other videos missed, because trust me, there's surprisingly a lot. And unlike the last section of the video, I will not be going in chronological order of when these shows came out, and you'll see how this benefits the flow of the video while you're watching. Okay. In 2002, Disney Channel came out with That's a Raven, basically the Iron Man of this shared universe. Due to the show's massive success, it got a spinoff years later in the form of the one, the only, Corey in the House. That's two shows on the board. Later, like way later, Disney actually made a That's a Raven revival, picking up where the original show left off 10 years later, thus obviously making it connected to both That's a Raven and Cory in the House. Boom, the Raven trilogy is already complete, only an unfathomable amount of shows to go. <sighs> and That's a Raven's last year, the series held the first ever Disney Channel crossover event with The Sweet Life of Zack and Cody and Hannah Montana. It was a three-part event with each episode leading into each other. What's funny is that Disney advertised it as like this huge crossover, when in all actuality, all three shows were only in the same room for like one minute. And don't get me wrong, it's a pretty cool scene with some good jokes and weird acting from Miley Cyrus, but they should have had more screen time together in my opinion. Oh yeah, I had a blast! By the way, y'all still haven't paid me for that. <laughs> no, seriously, why is she talking to her like this? Like she doesn't know English. Bye, Toshi! Welcome to America! Anyway, that's two more shows, plus the Hannah Montana movie on the board. Fast forwarding like 15 years, there's an episode of a recent Disney Channel sitcom called Just Roll With It, which has a very creative concept by the way. Main character Blair has a singing video go viral on the internet. Because of this, she is approached by Hollywood music manager Skeeter, Skeeter Swindell. Swindell. Oh my, I can't escape this dude! Skeeter Swindell about starting a music career under his label. However, if you notice, Skeeter is actually played by Hannah Montana star Jason Earls. And when you listen to him speak, you can tell that Skeeter Swindle is actually just Jackson Stewart under a stage name. He makes very obvious references to his sister Miley Stewart aka Hannah Montana while the live studio audience cheers and claps which would only bring confusion to a child who has never heard of or seen Hannah Montana. No one will ever know. You'll have the best of both worlds. You can do that? Absolutely! In fact, my own sister actually had a similar situation back in the day. All you need is a wig. Remember, this is 15 years later. It's really cool that they did this cameo, honestly. I never cared for Hannah Montana that much, but something like this kind of brings me an odd comfort, knowing that these characters from nearly two decades back are still around and kicking it. That was not a pun, by the way. What's really funny though is that if you remember, Hannah and Montana actually end with Miley coming clean and revealing to the world that she is in fact Hannah. I mention this because while Jackson makes obvious references to this sister of his that lived a double life as a pop star, this little girl has literally no idea who he's referring to. So tell me about your sister. So does Hannah Montana fall off in the future? All right, I'm getting off topic. Anyway, moving on to Sweet Life, obviously we know that this show had a sequel series called The Sweet Life on Deck, where the characters went to a boarding school on a boat. Disney had a spiritual sequel to the That's So Sweet Life with Hannah Montana crossover, but this time with Hannah and Wizards of Waverly Place, thus putting it, and this movie, and this other movie, in this universe. The Sweet Life connections don't just stop there, because not only did the show go on to get a movie, but it also had a bunch of small references and cameos with other shows that would then make them connected to this universe as well. In 2009, Disney launched a sister network to the channel called Disney XD. Its main purpose was to create content that appealed to mainly boys, as at the time, most of Disney Channel's most popular shows were heavily advertised towards girls, except obviously Sweet Life. What you may not know, however, is that many of these shows, through one way or another, are in fact canon to the shared Disney Channel universe, and the first show to make this connection and cross the bridge, so to speak, would be the series I'm in the Band, a very, very painfully unfunny show. There's an episode of I'm in the Band where the group wants to go on a vacation. Band member Ash remembers that... 
<laughs> remembers that he used to be in a competitive hand slap team with none other than Mr. Mosby. We learn something new about you every day, you strange, strange man. Uh, so he uses his connection with Mr. Mosby to try to get a gig to perform on the cruise ship, only for Mosby to turn him down thanks to some dumb breakup they had. The gang sneaks on the ship anyway, meet Zack and Cody, they do some stupid stuff, get caught, make up, perform a song on the ship that is the only Iron Weasel song available on Spotify, believe it or not, and it ends with them making this really, really terrible joke. So you guys go to school on a ship? Yep, it's a sweet life. You should join us. Oh, uh, can't. I'm in the band. <laughs> Get it? Because the name of the shows are I'm in the band and the Sweet Life Fun. Okay, boom, another show added. Dog with a Blog, everyone's favorite Disney show. Dog with a Blog's connection to this universe is one of my favorites, honestly, because of how insanely obscure it is. In the episode Cat with the Blog, the band Metal Wolf is mentioned. Sound familiar? Don't lie to me. Metal Wolf is the arch rival band in the previously mentioned show I'm in the band. You may be wondering. Why would this show, a relatively lesser known Disney sitcom, reference an even more lesser known Disney sitcom in the most obscure way possible? Well, turns out the creator of I'm in the Band actually wrote this episode of Dog Blog. That's what I'm calling it for short now, deal with it. Another show added. In season three of Ant Farm, you know, when they were in that weird border school and they started time traveling and stuff, there are multiple episodes that include Mr. Hashimoto, an obscure character from Sweet Life on Deck that appeared once. Mr. Hashimoto in Sweet Life was the CEO of Hashimoto Soda. He was known for making weird flavors of soda for his company. What's weird though is that in On Deck, although he did some pretty crazy and dark stuff like blindfolding the twins and their mom and had them taste test nasty soda flavors, which to be fair, he only did as punishment for Zack destroying the set, he wasn't that crazy. He even said he's a man of honor and wouldn't do certain things to deceive people. But what's really interesting is that Somewhere between his appearance in Sweet Life and his appearance in Ant Farm, he kind of lost his mind. This dude was sending out his daughter to help him with his evil schemes, he had no issue with harming innocent people if it meant succeeding with his plans, and he literally turned into a whole antagonist whose main goal was to destroy the life of Zoltan, the dude who was funding the school the ants were attending. It's crazy too, because the only reason why he was doing any of this is because he wanted to make a deal with Zoltan, but then Zoltan didn't like his soda, and then he just went full Joker mode. Out of all the connections in this universe, this one is probably one of my favorites. The fact that three years later, Disney decided to bring this random character from Sweet Life and give him a recurring role in Ant Farm is honestly hilarious. But it makes sense, because after doing a little digging, it turns out the same dude that directed the On Deck episode is the same one who directed the Ant Farm episode, making it obvious that this was done on purpose to have those two things connect, thus making Ant Farm a part of Earth 8. In the fourth season of Disney's Jesse, there's an episode where Emma, one of the Ross kids, decides it's time to be a rebel and do the exact opposite of what she's told to do. She runs away to a hotel, and lo and behold, it turns out she ran into the Tipton Hotel in New York, managed by the legend himself, Mr. Mosby. Mosby gives her advice on how to deal with kids because, well, if there's one thing he knows, it's how to deal with them. Jesse uses this advice to talk to Emma and, all right, let's be honest, we don't really care about that part. But what we do care about, however, is in the scene after, where Mosby is on the phone with Cody and tells him that he came across someone that looks exactly like Bailey. Cody says he's on his way to see for himself, in which Mosby replies with, Oh dear. This scene is really fun and creative, and if it wasn't for the fact that they decided to do this, most of the shows that came out during the Jesse era would not connect to this universe, including Jesse itself. The scene confirms a few things for us. One, after the kids graduated from 17's high, Mosby went on to live in New York and managed the Tipton Hotel there. Two, Cody and Mosby still have a relationship, as Mosby cared enough about him to exchange phone numbers with them sometime after school ended, because if my memory serves me right, Mosby never calls Cody during either shows. It's kinda nice to know that Mosby still talks to Cody to this day, and presumably Zach and the other kids as well. Third, and most important thing we learn, is that Mosby and Mrs. Tutwiler either never go through with the wedding, or they divorce. Mr. Mosby, if you can see, is not wearing a ring on his finger. We need to find out what happened to them. Maybe we'll find out in that Chance the Rapper Mosby prequel series coming to Disney Plus. I'm kidding, that isn't a real thing. I don't know how you guys felt for that. Anyway, Jesse is on the board now, and we can finally move on from the Sweet Life connections. Revenge of the Hemogoblin is a game that exists in Ant Farm that we later see appear in an episode of 2011's Kickin' It. 
This connection also brings in a few other Disney XD shows. Reporter Dale Davis is a character that originated in the greatest show ever made, Zeke and Luther, which is a show that is a lot more important than you think when it comes to connections, but we'll get to that a little later. Dale makes an appearance in Kickin' It, Zeke and Luther, and Parent Kings in what was a somewhat crossover event that Disney XD had centered around Heatwave episodes, which would then put all three shows on Earth 8. Remember when Disney Channel had that shooting star Wish Gone and Miss weekend where Miley Stewart, Corey Baxter, and Zack and Cody see the same shooting star? Well, Disney XD had their own version of that, but with the lunar eclipse. Characters from Kickin' It and characters from Lab Rats all experience the same eclipse and as a result, something strange happens in each episode from the block. Mighty Med was also a part of this mini crossover event, but even if it wasn't, it had a direct crossover with Lab Rats and even a spin-off show combining the two series, which would mean Lab Rats, Mighty Med, and Lab Rats Elite Force are also in the shared world. The small detail, even though it was pretty easy information to come across, is something that I saw missing from other videos about this topic. But let it be known that these shows are in fact in the same shared continuity. Thanks, Ant Farm! There's also an episode of Lab Rats where Bree says, Oh, Laffy Cat. If you don't get the reference, Laffy Cat is an online celebrity in the Kirby Buckets mythos. A deep, deep web of lore and multiversal discoveries that we'll actually get to much later into the video. I'm being dead serious. But for now, let's throw Mr. Buckets up on the board. Moving on to Jesse, that show is probably one of the most key shows in this world, as it contains the most crossover links out of any show in this universe. But first, let's talk about the spinoff I had in 2015, Bunked. Bunked was a sequel show to Jesse that was focused on Zuri, Emma, and Ravi in their adventures in Camp Kikiwaka. Stupid name. Noticeably missing from the show was the other Ross kid, Luke who I think was sent to summer school instead of the camp with the rest of the kids. I think that was the explanation they gave. But in all actuality, actor Cameron Boyce was on another show called Gamer's Guide to Pretty Much Everything, which, fun fact, is also in this universe due to a character from Elite Force appearing in it. Yes, Connor and Luke exist in the same world. I have an explanation for it. Keep watching. Because of Bunked being a spinoff of Jesse, even though it's a completely different show nowadays, that makes it obviously an Earth 8. Jesse had a crossover with Good Luck Charlie, one of my all-time favorite Disney shows. If you want to see me review it, make sure you subscribe and stuff like that. You know how that goes. Good Luck Charlie had a crossover with Shake It Up early in his run, adding it to the board. Also, in the episode Let's Potty... Alright, this one is going to blow your mind. In the episode Let's Potty, PJ and Gabe were playing a video game. Does this game look familiar to you at all? No? I'll give you a few more seconds. It's Hero Rising from the first ever Disney XD original series, Aaron Stone. The entire series is actually based around this game, so it's not just a small reference like the video game from Ant Farm. Aaron Stone actually links one of Disney Channel's biggest properties and one you might not expect to this universe, but we we'll get, get there when, when we, get, we there. get there. So, does this video game reference here mean that Aaron Stone is in this universe? In my opinion, yes. There's no real reason for me to rule it out, and there's nothing present in Aaron Stone or in any of these other shows that contradict it from being canon. And even if there was, I dare one of you to correct me on Aaron Stone lore. Like seriously, try. Like I, I would honestly be impressed if you did. And while we're on the topic, do you guys remember Crash and Bernstein? You know, when Disney Channel ripped off Cousin Skeeter from Nickelodeon. I, I did it again. What is it with this show? Anyway, there's an arcade that the main characters would often visit, and in it, we see a poster from Hero Rising. And, well, you know the drill. That's two shows added. Jesse also had a crossover with Austin and Allie, adding that terrible show to the board as well. There's another Jesse crossover that I'm actually refused to talk about until later, because not only is it really bad, I'm also not entirely sure if it's canon. So, I didn't forget about it, I know you're going to be thinking about it, but we're just going to save it. Moving on, the season 3 finale of Jesse features Parker and Joey from Liv and Maddie in a relatively large role, which puts Liv and Maddie in Earth 8, along with all the other shows. The most interesting of the crossovers that Jesse took part in happened in October 2015. A record-breaking seven shows, kinda, cross over with each other. There is this party in New York that a bunch of people from a different TV shows attended for different reasons. I'm not going into detail about this one, it's been done several times, just watch those videos if you want to. But the shows involved were Jesse, I Didn't Do It, Casey Undercover, Best Friends Whenever, Austin and Nally, Liv and Maddie, and Girl Meets World. I know what you're gonna say, I know, trust me, I have a whole section about what Girl Meets World being in this universe means, 
just be patient because before we move on, there's actually something really, really interesting that I need to address. And it actually pertains to Disney Channel Latin America. And I kid you not, Zeke and Luther. I promise you, this is 100% true. I am not making any of this up just because I love the show. This is 100% facts and facts only, just like I promised in the opener. Okay, so Disney Channel Latin America had a little shared universe of their own with their own shows. And one of these shows includes Peter Punk. Peter Punk is about a boy who hangs out with his friends and form a rock group together. I have nothing to say about the show because, I mean, obviously I haven't seen it, but there's one episode that serves as a full-blown canon crossover with Zeke and Luther. The episode, when translated into English, is titled The Duel, and in it, Zeke and Luther travel to Argentina for whatever reason. If I had to guess, it was maybe for a skating competition and after they won, because Zeke doesn't lose, they stayed in the area for a bit and hung out. Look, long story short, Zeke and Luther are here, Peter Punk is here, it's a crossover, boom. Peter Punk added to the list. Peter Punk has a crossover with another show called... Hold on, I think I'm gonna have to phone a friend for this one. Cuando toca la campaña. Thank you. Which in English translate to when the bell rings. Wait a minute. Why does that sound familiar? Oh, that's why. This show is basically the Latin American version of a Disney show that I actually haven't covered yet in this video because it wasn't really an actual show. As the Bell Rings, if you remember, was a series of shorts that Disney used to air during commercial breaks. It was actually the start of Demi Lovato's Disney career. This show apparently has a lot of versions worldwide, and this is the Latin American one, I guess? The band from Peter Punk appears in this show, which is connected to 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 this show, adding all those shows to the universe. Wow. <sighs> that that was wow that was a lot i mean hannah montana in the same universe as peter punked who would have thought but as amazing as it would be to end the video here there's more to this multiverse that meets the eye while it is true most disney shows took place in the same earth the channel every now and then would produce shows that did not connect to this world and sometimes they did it intentionally so it's time we dive into those other earths and truly start to getting into some weird multiversal shenanigans. So, as previously mentioned, while Earth 8 was alive and kicking and having a good time, there were still some outsiders that weren't fortunate enough to make it to the party. There's a lot of ground to cover and most of these are newer shows, so I'll go through them quicker than normal. Earth 9 would be Phil of the Future. Came out a little after Raven, but because of how the show was formatted and the plot of it, it really wouldn't have worked in a crossover with any of these other shows. Earth 10. While I was listing TV shows that included actresses like Selena Gomez and Miley Cyrus, some of you might have been expecting Sunny with a Chance starring Demi Lovato, another popular Disney sitcom, to appear on my list of shows connected to Earth Prime. But interestingly enough, Sunny with a Chance isn't connected in this universe at all. I'm pretty sure it was deliberately made to stick out from the rest. This isn't even something that occurred to me until I was watching an episode of So Random, the spin-off show that they made after Demi Lovato left. In it, they had Mia Tallarico, Lee Allen Baker, and even Bridget Miller guest star on the show. However, they were all playing themselves, not different characters, and certainly not the same ones from Good Luck Charlie. After doing some research, apparently this is something that was really common with Sunny with a Chance. They would occasionally mention Disney shows in the way that we would, as fictional. Chad's believing it. Yeah, well... Chad still believes that Miley and Hannah are two different people. <laughs> the kooky old lady in my vision! Who are you, Raven? <laughs> yep, that's me. As weird as it is, Sunny with a Chance and So Random are in a world all to themselves. Or are they? See, episode 14 of So Random broke from the tradition of having a musical guest and instead featured Miss Piggy in what I could only assume was cross-promotion for their 2011 movie. The whole time though, they treat Miss Piggy like she's a real person, and even in the in-between bits where they're not in sketches, the randoms are literally pitching ideas to her and seeing which one she likes the most. And because of this, I think it's safe to say that at least a version of the Muppets exists in this universe. 
I'm not too well versed with my Muppets lore to give an appropriate answer as to which Muppets iteration her appearance is canon to, assuming there even is some sort of Muppets canon. So for now, I'm just going to leave it alone and say that the Muppets, from some iteration, are canon to Earth-10, along with Sunny with a Chance and So Random. Oh, and I'm aware the Muppets already had a crossover with Good Luck Charlie, but it was only in a dream sequence and it seems pretty clear that they only exist as a TV show and movie characters in Earth Prime, not as actual people. Earth 11. Do you guys remember when Disney more or less bought the rights to the Jonas Brothers? From my memory, they had always been hanging around Disney for a while, but eventually they decided to just join them full time. They eventually got their own series on the channel, appropriately titled Jonas. When I was doing my research on the show, I learned a lot of interesting things. For starters, did you guys know that Adam Hicks from Zeke and Luther appeared on the show? Not, not as Luther, of course, but that's still really cool. But the second and most important thing that I learned is that although the show was called Jonas, they aren't actually playing the Jonas Brothers. Instead, they kept their first names that they already had, but the producers of the show, I guess, decided to drop their last names and replace it with Lucas. The reason why the show was called Jonas is because the name of the band is Jonas for whatever reason. Knowing these two things about the show makes it very easy to rule it not canon to Earth Prime or even Earth 10, as both Hannah Montana and Sunny with a Chance both have episodes with the Jonas Brothers in them playing themselves. Not to mention, there's an episode where David Henry and Emily Osment play themselves and not the characters on their respective shows. Weird how they handled that whole thing, honestly. Either way, we have enough evidence here that makes it very clear that Jonas or Jonas LA, whatever you want to call it, exists on its own Earth. While still on the topic of exploring different Earths, I think it's time to mention the fact that after 2015, it appears that Disney kind of just stopped trying to make a connected universe. You can tell because they started coming out with a huge slew of shows that had no connection to each other whatsoever. As the channel started to make more single camera shows and move away from traditional styled sitcoms, the idea of throwing in references to other projects of theirs I guess just wasn't a focus. What's also very likely is that a lot of these shows came out 13 to 15 years after the first crossover, and since then, like a whole new generation of writers started to take the place of the ones who probably left the channel and wrote all of those old sitcoms. Everything started to feel truly in their own universe, and honestly, that kind of makes me sad. I used to live off the stuff as a kid. I loved whenever they would do crossovers, and even if some of them are bad, I feel like a lot of kids could still enjoy them. Nickelodeon recently did a crossover between five of their current shows, which is honestly amazing and it's something Disney never really did. You have to admit, that's like really cool. If I was good, I promise you I would have recorded that episode and watched it on loop over and over again like it was the underdog VHS tape that I had. Anyway, Nick proved that with a little creativity and a lot of plot convenience, crossovers between kids shows can still happen and I hope to see it return to the network someday soon. But for now, it appears that Andy Mack, Bizarre Vark, Mech X4, Stuck in the Middle, Cupid Cami Ash the World, Cindy to the Max, Gabby Duran and the Uncitables, Secrets of the Soul for Springs, Ultraviolet and the Black Scorpion, and the Villains of Valley View are all in separate universes. Although, keep an eye on that last one. It's created by the same dude who did Lab Rise, and it's about supervillains or whatever. There's no way they don't include references to Bionic Teenagers or Davenport or even Mighty Bad, I don't know. Oh wait, speaking of lab rats, there's an episode where Leo gets sent to another universe, right? And what about those episodes of Ant Farm where they were in an alternate world and they're all monsters and stuff? Or that episode of Sweet Life where they travel to a different Earth? Or that other episode of Sweet Life where they travel to a different Earth? Or that entire Kirby Buckets event where every episode they go to a different universe? That has like a million different universes to this list, would it not? This multiverse is massive, man. Especially Earth Prime. I mean, that Earth is so big, it even has a bunch of clones and doppelgangers in it. But, uh, how exactly does that work again? Let's talk about it. When you have a bunch of TV shows produced by the same channel, and oftentimes by the same exact production company, it's common that they will reuse actors and have them play whatever role fits their needs for the episode. Some of these instances are really minor, probably done before an actor gets a full-time job on another show, while others are deliberately done to please fans. However, the problem that happens when you unintentionally create a shared universe that shares thousands of different writers and producers, they aren't really thinking about that kind of stuff. Matter of fact, 
most showrunners and producers aren't really aware what the other shows on the network are doing because, well, they probably don't care. The thing is though, it's happened so many times at this point, if you crunch the numbers and add everything up, it just really doesn't make sense realistically. You may think I'm exaggerating, but like, just look at this. In Earth Prime, we have two Adam Hickses, three Zendayas, four Olivia Holtz, four Rainy Rodriguez, four different Dwight Howards, that one blows my mind, and five Cameron Boyces. And, get this, not only does Selena play three different characters, four if you include the canceled Armin spinoff, but there's even an episode of Zeke and Luther where they confirm that Selena Gomez herself also exists in this world. But the question is, how is this even possible? And more importantly, why are there so many doppelgangers of the same person in this world? Well, I have a theory that just might answer all of these questions. Enter Steve Urkel. Remember when I said that Girl Meets World will come back later in the video in a rather important role? Well, this is that time. Girl Meets World was a spinoff of the hit 90s sitcom Boy Meets World. Boy Meets World was part of the TGIF block on ABC back then, which featured a bunch of other shows. Whether it was through direct crossovers or references to other shows, that block features sitcoms that were all connected to each other. Because of this, shows like Sabrina, Step by Step, Hanging with Mr. Cooper, Perfect Strangers, Full House, and as a result Fuller House, are all canon to Earth Prime. Hanging with Mr. Cooper and Aaron Stone taking place in the same universe is not something that I expected to find out while doing this video, but here we are. The reason why I am bringing this up is because one of the shows that was a part of this block is the iconic sitcom Family Matters. The show was focused on the Winslow family, Carl, Harriet, Eddie, Laura, and Ju That was weird. Let's try that again. Ju wow, they really are trying to make everyone forget she existed, huh? But of course, as the show went on, it became more and more focused on a standout character, Steve Urkel. The show moved on from its family-centric nature, and instead it was about this nerdy kid who would invade the lives of his neighbors every day, usually unintentionally. But why am I bringing this up? What possible significance would this have on the doppelgangers of Earth Prime? Well, you see, as the series went on, they started running out of ideas. Steve's adventures went from things that weren't really possible, but were still appropriate in a sitcom setting, to going back in time and fighting pirates, shrinking, dolls coming to life, getting a loss in space, and making a serum that would turn himself into a much cooler and smoother person, aka Stefan. A very noticeable thing that Steve did, however, was make a clone of himself in the season 7 finale. At first, he made the cloning device and used it to clone plants and inanimate objects, but eventually he came up with the idea to clone himself. Although he didn't think so at first, the experiment was successful. Later though, he explained that he destroyed the machine so no one corrupt could take control over it and create an army or rule the world. So what if, when he destroyed it, some of the energy released from the machine caused duplicates of people to appear all throughout the world. Steve found out about this and located every duplicate, tried his best to give each and every one of them a new identity and a new personality, and paid them off so they wouldn't tell anyone about it so he wouldn't get in trouble with the law. He put all the babies in kids with foster homes, injected serum into the adults to make them have different personalities, and created fake birth certificates for each and every one of them just to clean up his actions. But because he had spread these people so far apart from each other, he thought it would be nearly impossible for two of the same person to actually meet each other. But what about Maddie saying she looked like actress Ashley Tisdale? Well, I mean, you saw the episode. Every single person denied that Maddie looked like her, and Maddie clearly wasn't creeped out over the fact that she had an exact clone of herself running around starring in many films. So my answer, considering we never saw what Earth 8's Ashley Tisdale looks like, what if she actually was just a lookalike? What I mean is, we know in the multiverse that not everyone who shares the same name has the same face, and that everyone who shares the same face has the same name. So what if, in Earth Prime, Ashley Tisdale isn't actually our Ashley Tisdale, just someone that looks exactly like her? But all right, you might be thinking, Nostalgia, you're just making all this up. You don't even believe it's yourself. And well, you may be right, but do you want to know the one piece of information that ties this entire theory together? The information that proves that this theory holds weight? Out of all the actors who have played different roles in this universe, there is one that has the most out of anyone. He holds the records for the most doppelgangers in Nerf Prime. And that man is Reginald Bell Johnson, aka Carl Otis Winslow, Urkel's next door neighbor that generally is the victim of most of Steve's inventions going rogue. 
Reginald has played roles in Family Matters, I'm in the Band, Bachelor Raven, I Didn't Do It, Girl Meets World, The Hewleys, and The Parkers, which are two shows that through a long list of connections are also in this world. It would make perfectly good sense that the man with the most doppelgangers out there is the man that lived in the same house as the machine when it broke. Look, I don't care what you say. Somehow, some way, this is the idea that I'm running with, at least in my head. It is your choice to believe it or not, and 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 I, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I know. Super far fetched, and there's so many plot holes with that theory. I just wish there was an episode of a TV show set in this universe that had two characters played by the same actor meeting each other. That would answer all of our questions. Oh, wait. Yes, there is. As I mentioned before, just about every ABC show in the 90s were in the same universe. And one of those shows included Tim Allen's hit sitcom, Home Improvement. I used to love the show when I was a kid, man. Come home from school, make a cheese sandwich, fire up ABC family, get attacked by a dog that broke into my house. That actually happened to me, by the way. A long time after Home Improvement ended, however, Tim Allen went on to star in a new show called Last Man Standing. In the final season of that show, Allen actually reprised his role as Tim the Toolman Taylor. Two characters from two different shows played by the same actor are interacting with each other in a crossover episode that is fully 100% canon and not a dream sequence. As a Home Improvement fan, it actually kind of made me happy to see that Tim and the family are still out there somewhere doing stuff, living life, breathing air, and I'm singing the iCarly theme song. But what does that mean for Earth Prime? How did these characters interact with each other? And what does it confirm about how doppelgangers are treated in this universe? Tim's introduction comes from Mike Baxter's wife, saying that the handyman they hired from Detroit looks exactly like him. When the two meet, both of them are surprised, confused, and a bit freaked out over this strange occurrence, but no one involved seems to be too freaked out. Their mindset is, hey, this is super weird, but because these are people that have no idea about the large universe they live in, filled with monsters and spies and superheroes and Steve Urkel, the reaction is just normal. I mean, there are really weird stories of people running into people that look exactly like them, and a lot of these are super crazy. That being said, you could still theorize that maybe what we see is different than what they see, and that instead of being played by the same actor, they just see someone who looks eerily similar to them, but that would just be doing the most, honestly. These are fictional shows, and as fun as it would be to apply logic to them, it would be even more fun if we didn't. If they want to do something for the sake of a joke, they'll do it, and you're just gonna have to deal with it. If that's what the script commands, then that's what the script commands. If this was something like Breaking Bad or The Sopranos, then yes, it genuinely wouldn't make any sense. But I mean, these are family shows made to make us laugh. So stop thinking and laugh. While discussing some of the things that take place in Earth Prime, I mentioned how not every crossover or reference should be taken as canon. Some crossovers are specifically made to be a pocket story that takes place in their own little universe. Or, there are some references that seemingly make two things connected, but thanks to evidence that we've seen from one of the other shows or movies in the universe, it would be impossible to rule it as such. An example of this is found in the movie franchise Descendants. For all the old people watching this video, Descendants is about the children of iconic Disney movie villains. We have Carlo, son of Cruella de Vil, Jay, son of Jafar, Evie, daughter of the Evil Queen, and their gang's leader Mal, daughter of Maleficent. I'm not going to go too deep into the Descendants lore because I really don't care about that movie or any of them, but in the first Descendants movie, there's a scene where Carlos is playing a video game. And that video game is quite clearly Hero Rising from Aaron Stone. So, before I ask you if you think that this means that Descendants is in this universe, let me lay out what that would mean. Descendants is, according to actress Dove Cameron, 100% canon to all of those classic Disney movies. It's canon to Dalmatians, canon to Aladdin, canon, canon, canon. So if these movies are in the same universe as Descendants, and Descendants has this reference to Aaron Stone, are you telling me that Sleeping Beauty is in the same universe as I'm in the band? Because my brain just won't allow that to happen. But fortunately, it doesn't need to, because after doing research, and by research I mean remembering something obscure from a random episode of a TV show, I have put together that although he is playing the same game, and even using the same avatar as the main character, this does not 
make Descendants canon to this universe. Wanna know why? Because in the first episode of Perry Kings, King Brady sees Mason for the first time and calls him Aladdin? Thus meaning that Brady has seen the movie Aladdin. Aladdin can't exist in this universe as a real thing and the movie. Plus, you have to use a bit of common sense here. The most likely reason they use footage from this game is because it's much easier to use a quick clip from a show about video games with plenty of choices to choose from instead of hopping on Blender or Maya or Unity and actually taking the time to develop a world and put in characters and stuff. So, as interesting and confusing as that would have been, I am officially ruling Descendants not a part of Earth Prime. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that Jesse had a crossover with a show that might not actually be canon. If you were watching Disney around that time, you know that I am of course talking about the episode of Ultimate Spider-Man, which featured the cast of Jesse. At first, you may think, well, boom, there you go. That's all the confirmation we need. But not exactly. In the episode, the characters of Jesse seem to not even be remotely phased that Spider-Man exists. When he walks by them, there's not a moment of, oh, yo, it's him. They just kind of treat it like it's normal, as any New Yorker in the Marvel Universe would. But if that's the case, then why don't they ever mention the fact that Spider-Man exists in Jesse? Even after this crossover, they never even once mentioned the fact that they met him. But okay, I would see why someone would view this as not enough hard evidence to rule as non-canon. I would need more evidence from one of the shows or movies on this earth that would contradict the existence of this episode. In the Labrath and Mighty Med crossover, the main characters from Labrath are surprised to hear that superheroes exist. As far as they knew, superheroes only exist in comic books. If world famous Spider-Man, and as a result the rest of the Avengers, existed in this universe, then why would Leo have reacted the way that he did? I'm pretty sure even a big plot point in Mighty Med was that superheroes are supposed to be secret. So there's no way that Spider-Man and the other Marvel heroes exist in a world where nobody is aware that superheroes exist, right? So as a result, I am ruling it obviously not canon. But just because it's not canon to the Disney shows, that doesn't mean it's not canon to Ultimate Spider-Man. You can have the same set of people exist in another universe as we've discussed before with the Jonas Brothers for example. So it's very possible that the Jesse gang does exist in the Ultimate Spider-Man universe, just not the exact same one from the TV show. That being said, I think that is enough evidence to add Earth 12041, the Ultimate Spider-Man Earth, to the Disney Channel multiverse. But uh, if that's the case, then what about the Phineas and Ferb crossover? In 2013, Phineas and Ferb released a crossover with Ultimate Spider-Man and Avengers Assemble entitled Mission Marvel. This crossover, however, isn't really considered to be canon in the Phineas and Ferb fandom. Same applies to the Star Wars one. They're just fun one-offs meant to bring in views or please fans. I don't think this crossover took place in the normal Phineas and Ferb universe either, but since there's not really any strong evidence that backs me up, at least none that I could find, I'll let you decide. But for now, I'm going to place Phineas and Ferb, Mission Marvel, and the universe all to themselves. A lot of people have mentioned that, oh, well, because of the fact that we have this connection here, that means that at least through the multiverse, the MCU is canon to the Disney Channel universe too, right? And honestly, I don't think that's true. And I think there's actually evidence to support that. The MCU has made it clear that the way time travel works in their universe is much different than what we've seen in previous adaptations of time travel. Their logic is that when you go back in time and change something, it doesn't change the past or the future. It just creates a different timeline, or in other words, a different Earth. All of the worlds in the MCU are connected through time travel, and the only way a new Earth would appear is if someone were to alter a timeline. With this being in mind, there are several shows in Earth Prime alone that show that time travel and the multiverse does not work this way. Because of the fact that we have these shows that prove the MCU's way of time travel to be literally false, it would be impossible for it to exist in the same multiverse. I mean, think about it. The only real multiverse crossovers that the MCU has done at the time of this video are with universes that don't already have an established time travel rule. The Raimi universe, the Amazing universe, and the Venom slash Morbius universe are all able to be canon to the Marvel Cinematic Multiverse, but not to anything else. So, although the MCU literally feels like Disney Channel shows sometimes, the Illuminati, their connection is quite literally impossible. What the Marvel animated crossovers do confirm, however, is that the Marvel comic universes, along with some animated ones, are actually connected via the multiverse. 
We know this for a fact, because in one of the Spider-Verse crossovers in the comics recently, Drake Bell Spider-Man from the Ultimate series had a crossover with Earth-616 Miles and the Spider-Man from the 60s show. Because of this, although Ultimate didn't take place in Earth Prime, it is in the multiverse, which does make every single universe that has ever been in a Marvel comic eligible to be in the same multiverse as Earth Prime and all the other Disney Channel shows. Just, you know, not the MCU. The Illumawadi? Moving on to DC, there's an episode of Scooby-Doo and Guess Who that features Steve Urkel. This same show has a crossover with several different DC characters, including The Flash, Wonder Woman, and of course Batman. Being from Family Matters, Steve's appearance in the Scooby-Doo show would, to some people, confirm that not only would the Mystery Incorporated gang exist in this world, but also the DC characters featured in that series as well. And at first you might be thinking, uh, no, it's impossible for it to be connected, but I mean, I feel like the amount of stuff that we covered today would show that anything is possible. But don't forget that the Muppets literally exist in the same world as Sunny with a Chance. So if you're telling me that Batman exists in the same universe as Corrin House, I will believe you until I come across information that says otherwise. But, of course, I did just that. Funny enough, my source for this is the same one that I used last time, Labras. In the very first episode of the show, Leo finds out his new stepdad has a secret underground basement in which as a result he exclaims, My new dad is Batman! There you go. Leo knows that Batman has an underground cave, which means he has a fictional understanding of Batman, which means that the crossover with Urkel and Scooby-Doo takes place in its own universe separate from Earth Prime, putting it in the Disney Channel multiverse, but outside of the main world, making it not canon. What is pretty cool though, is that they've made it very clear in the past that every single thing that DC has ever made is canon to their multiverse, which means that every Earth in the DC multiverse is in fact part of the Disney Channel multiverse, making it even bigger. And I guess that means that Ninja Turtles are also a part of the multiverse, and Cartoon Network, and Hanna-Barbera, and Looney Tunes? which also kind of makes the Trix commercials connected in a way. And if the Looney Tunes are in this multiverse, then that means that Who Framed Roger Rabbit is as well, which just circles back to all of Disney being in the Disney Channel multiverse. Huh, okay. Uh, how about that? The reason why I thought it was important to go over this information is because the other videos that talked about this subject, well, didn't. Instead of doing the research, they kind of just assumed that everything, including Marvel and DC, all took place in Earth Prime because of their crossovers with Earth Prime shows. But when you do a little digging, you would find that that is not the case, as it would lead to way too many inconsistencies. But, I mean, I get it. A lot of the evidence that I used didn't really take much research, it was more so just me remembering certain things about the shows because I've seen so many episodes of them. But. I think that made me the perfect candidate to make a complete map of this world and all the other ones because I have a deeper knowledge of these shows than most people do, and probably should. Also too, like I said earlier in the video, I have a weird attachment to things that don't actually matter and I always put in 110%. Even if it means watching episodes of I'm in the Band and Dog with the Blog. So with all that being said, that wraps up the complete map of the Disney Channel Multiverse. I wanna give a huge thanks to everyone that has watched this video. I've been wanting to make this video for like a really long time now, but a year ago I wasn't even a YouTuber. I had retired from the stuff I was making before to focus on other things. When this idea sparked, I really felt like it was something that should be made, and although others have done it in the past, they were all still missing vital information. They also were only focusing on the one Earth, which was Earth Prime, and didn't really talk about the other worlds in the multiverse. I thought that would be the one thing that would make my video stand out from the rest, and well, hopefully it does. This is just the start of this new era of content that I want to create for this channel. I have my next few videos already planned out, and by the time you're watching this, I've probably already completed the script for my next video, so it should be out soon. If you want more content like this in the future talking about the good, bad, and ugly of Disney Channel, Nickelodeon, Cartoon Network, Boomerang, uh, the hub, uh, ready, set, learn, I, I, I don't know. Make sure to click that subscribe button. Big shout out to the fine people over at TV Tropes for helping me put together this video. I couldn't have done it without you guys. I'm Mr. Nostalgia, and I'm out for now. Peace.
But what if it didn't just end there? Characters from Leave the Beaver appeared on this series, The Love Boat. The Love Boat also had a crossover with The Brady Bunch. There's an episode of the Nick and Night show, Instant Mom, where characters from The Brady Bunch, Family Ties, Happy Days, Sister Sister, and The Cosby Show all make appearances. Family Ties is connected to Perfect Strangers via a direct reference to a hardware company from that show. Family Matters was a spinoff of Perfect Strangers. Corey from Boy Meets World is pen pals with Steve Urkel, and since Girl Meets World crossover with the other Disney Channel shows, that means that Leave It to Beaver and Kirby Buckets take place on the same. Er yeah, whatever. I'm done.